Hi, it's Rob Moore here, and I'm doing a bit of a, an experiment. This is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, and I was doing an Ask Me Anything on a couple of our communities, uh, and um, I probably got about 200 questions. And one of them was from a lovely lady who I've start, started to get to know very well. And we're going to call her M, in case anything that she asks is, is quite sensitive. Um, and I've got her actually on the phone right now. Um, we just decided literally to do this, what, five, ten minutes ago. Um, so I'm going to do a live coaching call on a live video and I'm recording it for a podcast. Now, if it doesn't, if you don't ever hear this on the podcast, you know, this experiment was a bridge too far for me. Um, so M, thanks for, I guess, being courageous enough to bring to me, um, you know, some of your biggest challenges. Because a lot of people, I think on social media, they're a bit like, oh, things are all right. Or they ask sort of questions that they want other people to see them asking rather than actually what they really want to ask, what their real big challenges are. So, Em, I'm going to listen to you ask me the question and then I'm going to have to sort of summarise it back if that's all right for the people because they can't hear you. So do you want to let me know what your challenge is and then what the question is that you think I could help you with? Okay. Yeah. So you don't like competing with anyone and whenever anyone looks like they're competing with you, you just shy away from it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. OK. And so if you could have a question that might help you go some way to overcome that, what would the question be? OK. Right. So you, need, you want behaviours and strategies to grow and to conquer. Um, I love that. I've never been asked it in that way before. All right. So, um, so if you in any way compare yourself to competition, the risk is you make yourself feel less significant, less skilled and valuable than anybody else. And I feel this too, because obviously there are influencers that have more followers than me and more reach than me. Uh, and I often compare myself to how many downloads or followers uh, they have, which is more than me. And I, and I rarely go, do you know what? I've probably got more property than them or, um, you know, I might have a nicer family dynamic than them. Now, I'm not saying I'm not now trying to elevate myself above my competition. But isn't it interesting that generally when we compare ourselves to people, um, Often it is minimising ourselves. Uh, and a good exercise to do, this is for M listening and everybody, is to uh, instead of looking at what other people may have as advantages or strengths, look at what you have as advantages or strengths. So and the simple way to do this is to get a piece of paper or a fold of some kind of Evernote or some kind of, you know, app or something that you use. And literally, write a list of 50 things that you're great at. Um, and that might be your relationships with people. You might be an amazing mother or parent. You know, it, it might be that you have a specific hobby or passion or profession that you're really good at. Um, and each time you find yourself comparing yourself to someone or competition unfavorably, you want to balance that. Um, because when we're out of balance, that's when we probably are likely to have disruptions in our life. And that out of balance, by the way, can be the opposite, whereby I'm brilliant, I'm better than everyone else, I'm on a roll, I'm unstoppable. And sometimes the wisdom is doing the opposite, which is listing your weaknesses and watching out for where you could have challenges. Um, and I tend to be quite an extreme person, which means I sort of flit between thinking I'm no good, not good enough, comparing myself to other people and then getting a bit ahead of myself and thinking, hey, things are going well, you know, I'm on a roll here, you know, I've got some momentum. This is what I've been working for my whole life. I'm really excited. Come on, let's have it. I could do this. And then I often have a fall. So, you know, like obviously you, M. now I might not be answering your question directly, so stay with me because this is one of a few things I want to share with you. But, you know, you may depositioning and you may be depositioning or depedestalizing yourself compared to, um, you know, competitors in the market and other people might be overconfident. And so whenever you get into those spaces of, you, you know, like minimizing or maximizing over or under, the wisdom is in getting the balance, which is looking at the other side. So, um, you know, I haven't been doing podcasting and, you know, let's call it 
personal branding or influencer marketing, whatever you want to call it, I haven't been doing it that long. You know, I've been doing property for 12 years, but really building my own personal brand, I've only really been doing for three. So why am I comparing someone who's done it for 20 years in America, when America have 350 million people and the UK only have 70 million people, when you know, I've been doing it a quarter of the amount of time? Why aren't I, why aren't I looking at some of these influencers and, say, influencers and saying, you, you know, well, they're not British, they're American, and British is my uniqueness. And you know, they maybe uh, don't have a balanced life in other areas, like a family dynamic or whatever, which you know, I, I do, or they haven't written 12 books and I have, or they haven't built a 720 year property portfolio, which I have. Um, and even saying that makes me feel a bit uncomfortable because it sounds like I'm bragging, but I'm not. What I'm doing is trying to take you through a thought process in my head of trying to maintain this balance. So in, in that one regard, comparing yourself to competition, you, you know, often just depositions you and makes you feel um, insignificant. So you want to make yourself feel significant without feeling overblown. The next thing is, um, there's, there's room in this space for all of us. And so often, you know, worrying about competitors in the marketplace or competitors put a, an offering on a property and you sort of hide because you know you think they're better or you don't want to get into that space of competition, um, th that might be a scarcity mentality, i.e., you know, they're going to beat me, they're going to win, I'm going to lose. Um, they're going to get the best deals, I'm not. Uh, whereas in reality, there is room for all of us. And so if we have a more abundant mindset, because actually competition create fair prices, create fair exchange. Uh, you know, they, they actually keep you uh, balanced between aggression and defensive, between... Um, you know, putting yourself out there and making sure that you actually work on your products and services. If you had no competition, then, uh, you know, with the, the, the market forces at play, then you probably wouldn't serve people very well. You wouldn't be committed to creating gr good products and services. Um, and, and anything that you buy in the marketplace also wouldn't have that fair exchange environment. So competition serves to keep us balanced humble, creating good products and services, caring, serving, solving, taking feedback, growing, managing our own emotions and getting better at that. Um, now, of course, regulation in the marketplace does that too, but we should be very grateful to our competition. I've learned probably more from my competition than I have from my fans. You know, obviously I love having fans. It makes me feel good. But, you know, most of my fans go, yeah, Rob, I love your work. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, Rob, you know, and, and and all I learn about that is that, you know, people are agreeing with what I've done. It doesn't challenge me to improve my weaknesses. It doesn't challenge me to go and find new information, to check my congruence, to check, you, you know, if I'm spending enough time with research and analysis and stress testing my products and services and message. So we often see competition as something external and something that doesn't serve us, that hinders us. But... In reality, our competition probably serves us more, um, you know, than anyone who doesn't challenge us. But it challenges our ego. Um, so instead of feeling fear or minimization towards competition, seek them out, learn from them, try and meet up with them, have lunch with them, work out what they're doing that you don't know, try and give value to them. Um, and I only really had a bad relationship with competitors when I perceived them to be challenging or disrupting me and my life. But as soon as I opened my mind to seeing that they're a necessary part of a marketplace of which I get a lot of benefit from in everything that I buy anyway, and actually I could become friends with them and learn from them and maybe even teach them, and if you think about it from a strategic point of view, it's far better to keep your competitors close anyway, not get aggressive with them, but try and collaborate with them. Uh, I, I found that um, that served me a lot better. Um, but in the early days, my critics and my competitors, what they did was they scratched and picked at scabs of my own lack of self-worth. Um, and I felt like I needed people to lift me up so I needed followers, fans, friends, you know, I needed um, 
sorry it's early in the morning my brain's a bit there I'm normally i'm normally on five in the mornings but um yeah I've, I've, i had a migraine five six days ago and it completely wiped me out so bear with me i'll get there um but i used to, i used to need people to fill me up so I would have this big void of not feeling good about myself and I would need people to give me compliments to fill it up. Now, if you rely on external forces and, and people to fill your voids, that is a dangerous game and you're probably never going to be fully fulfilled. Um, you can't really get happiness and uh, satisfaction from with, without. You kind of get it from within. Well, you need it from within. So this is why when people give credit to themselves and honour and love themselves... Um, inside, then their external world tends to improve, their confidence and therefore the results that they manifest. Um, and contrary to what people think, because, you know, I'm pretty active in the, in the marketplace and, I'm, and, I, and you know, I, I do a lot of marketing. Um, I've struggled with this for most of my life of needing external validation to feel good about myself. Um, and the problem with that is you get addicted to it and you need it. Uh, and so you go to the places and the people that will give it to you where you don't get growth, where you're comfortable because they don't challenge you. So you shy away from all the areas and where your growth is, which is where competitors are and critics are. Um, so you don't grow. You get addicted to people saying that you're OK, you're good enough and that you need that. So you create this almost like little pity party of, of that then when you don't that you become even more vulnerable and then you rely on that even more and so it's like a self-fulfilling addiction um but what in reality you need is to get out there and for people to say you're not good enough um and for you to learn by being critiqued and having competitors outbid you or um you, you know get deals that you feel that um you know you would like to get involved in so what we think we need the most doesn't serve us. And what we need the most is on that edge of fear and discomfort, if you like. Um, does that answer any of your questions or does that raise more? So, what, so what's it answered and what does it raise? Yeah. Yeah. The only way we grow is to be challenged. The only way we grow. Now, you know that. I know that. Everyone watching and listening knows that. We all know logically when we look at someone else. If we were coaching someone else, we would say the only way that you grow is through challenge, i.e. taking something meaningful and difficult and going through some pain or fixing the problems and going through a bit of an emotional washing machine of not feeling good enough and, and exposed and vulnerable and having to take rejection and being a humble student. And, you know, because it's more comfortable to um, to help people and show how much you know than it is to be the, be the vulnerable student. But we know when we go through that, at the other end of that, when we get that deal or you, you know, we master that thing, like when you wear a white belt for the first time in martial arts or whatever. We know how good we feel. Um, and Dr. David Lieberman, who's a scientific sort of researcher in, in the science of happiness, has, has done a lot of research into happiness. And he says that the most deep sense of happiness is progress towards a worthy goal. So progress is growth and growth is uncomfortable. A worthy goal is a goal that you value highly, not a goal that you value lowly. So what a lot of us are doing are looking for, to pick very easy things to make us feel happy. But in reality, the challenges, the difficulties, like doing a really hard session at the gym and, you know, getting pushed by a personal trainer or mastering a skill that's really difficult or, you know, getting out into the market where you've got to, you've got to fight for clients and you've got, you know, competitors who have probably been doing it longer than you. And you're trying to build this brand and maybe you feel vulnerable because you, you haven't got a lot of experience yet. Um, all those things are worthy goals to you. Um, so often the bigger the goal, the more worthy the goal, the more happy you feel when you attain it, but the more challenged you feel going through it. So, but to say I'm not going to enter the market or I'm not going to offer on the property or I'm not going to compete with people is to paradoxically become less happy because in the moment it's comfortable. So the initial feeling is relief and that is a form of happiness. But then the feelings grow. I'm not good enough. Why do I shy from these situations? Why can't I? Why am I weak? Why do I, you know, why do I fear such rejection? I'm not living my purpose. I've got a bigger vision. I know I can do this, but I'm not. And then they create 
stronger negative feelings. And then that grows. Um, now, this thing about fear and confidence, I think it's important for me to say, M, before I let you ask some more questions on it. And that is that people have this misperception that confidence is binary, i.e. he is confident, she is not confident, she was born confident, he will never be confident. That is a complete myth. And I, if I can help people get that out of their head and learn the truth about confidence, I think more people will be more confident. So here's the reality of confidence. Everyone has inner and outer confidence in things that they feel like they have got experience in, that they've learned, that they've mastered, that people for many years have told them that they're good at, that they've got results in, that they've seen the physical proof. And anyone watching and listening, I would challenge you, think of something that you know you're good at, you know, even if it's playing computer games or pub quizzes, it doesn't matter because it's not relevant. You could take the most introvert, shy person uh, and get them on a computer game, whether they do for eight hours every night from 7 p.m. till early hours of the morning, and they will come out of themselves and be confident and cocky and, 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 you know, because they have honoured that. And they know that they're good at that. But you take that same person, you get, get them to do a public speech and, and they will wilt. And I'm the same. So I, I, people perceive I have confidence. I, I have a lot of lack of confidence. I'm not confident at yoga. I used to be good at martial arts, but I haven't done, done it for years. And I want to go back into sparring and training. But I, I've kind of lost my confidence. And I feel like I'll be starting again. And I'll be a humble student. And I'll know that I should be better than I am. And there's all these voices that go on in my head. So, you know, I've got a punch bag up in my gym, which I don't even hit. Uh, so... I'm only confident on podcasting and speaking on property and writing books. Because I've done it a lot. And I was vulnerable the first time I started it. So here is the reality. No one is confident. No one is not confident. Everyone is confident in something that they've done and honoured and learned and got skills in and experience. And no one is confident in anything that they've never done before that they start from scratch. Now, you'll get some people who will show some false bravado and confidence. But that's their way of trying to overcome the fear and the starting at the start. You'll have other people that are the opposite, that, that show sort of a lot of introversion and, and real lack of confidence. But they're, do, they're both doing the same thing, which is protecting themselves from feeling vulnerable and exposed. Now, that fear is, is worthy and it serves us. If we didn't have that fear of not being good at something, you know, it, it, like, for example, public speaking, it's a worthy fear to have. Because 2000 years ago, or however long, if you went and did something publicly uh, and you failed at it, you'd probably get killed. Um, you know, that this is what happened back then. So, you know, if you got outed from your tribe, you probably died. So it's pretty worthy fear to have. But what's happened is as society has grown faster than our brain can evolve and adapt, because we still have a lot of primitive parts of our brain, which we need for survival, we get it out of context. So, for example, people fear public speaking worse than death because 2000 years ago it led to death, but it doesn't anymore. It just doesn't. So if... If you as an individual can contextualise your fear or lack of confidence, i.e. if I challenge myself to do this thing, make the offer, go on an open house viewing when people, other people are there that are more experienced than me, you know, go and do a live feed video or sell to a client. If you can say, I won't die and my fears are 2000 years old and what's the worst that will happen? Well, the worst that will happen is um, I'll feel a bit vulnerable, but I'll learn something from feeling vulnerable because what feeling vulnerable makes us do is work out what went wrong. When you do something well, you don't sit there for hours going, oh, well, why did I mess that up? And how do I learn from that? And, you know, I'm not good enough and I've got to work it out to be better. You only do that when you, what people perceive as failure. So you, what M, what are you very, very good at? Okay, so you sit. Yeah, so don't no, no, don't don't talk yourself out of it. Don't talk yourself don't talk yourself out of it. So you're great at setting targets. You're great at analysing situations. So you could probably run a seminar on analysing situations and setting targets. Uh, and many of us who are watching and listening would probably be students of yours. And you'd probably come to life and show passion and give us some humour and stand tall and proud. And. and every master was once a disaster and every winner was once a beginner. Uh, and as such, we just have to understand that the purpose of this humility and feeling like a student is for us to not go and do something stupid and crazy. 
Um, because when you're new, uh, if you had false confidence and bravado, you'd go and do something stupid. You'd waste a load of money on a deal. You know, you'd get yourself into a lot of trouble. So this humility, this vulnerability, this feeling uncomfortable serves us. It serves us not to do anything stupid. Um, and, and so I try and put myself in, that, myself in that situation as much as I can without taking too big a risk to remind myself that there's always something to learn. But in that moment, you are probably also the most open to learning and to growth. Because when you have already got experience, you're probably, well, no, it doesn't. you don't do it like that, you do it like this, you don't do it like that, you do it like this. You probably have a more closed mind because you know what works and you know what doesn't. So are there any big fears you have around going and offering on deals or getting yourself out there in this um, competitive marketplace? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the fear of failure and rejection. Um, how do I get over that? Because I know that will hurt if it happens and it could derail me. Um, well, the first thing I need to say is I don't know anyone on, on the planet who has that. Um, sorry, who doesn't have that, you know, i.e. everyone on the planet has those feelings. And I think we need to be careful what media we put into our brains because sometimes... You know, these hard workers, these hustlers, these influencers with social media, you know, they're always giving out advice. Um, and sometimes the perception is that they've got it made, that they're lucky, that they're strong, that they're, you know, they're relentless, they're, they're rejection proof. No one is rejection proof. Everybody feels vulnerable. And, and, you know, let's be honest, who likes rejection? No one. And if someone says they like rejection, what they've done is they've learned to manage the meaning of rejection in their mind. You know, there's a book called Reject Me, I Love It. Um, and, you know, no one likes rejection. But um, when we say Reject Me, I Love It, what we mean is, well, we're one rejection closer to a win. But even through that rejection after rejection, we still have to keep talking ourselves up, picking ourselves up, etc. Um, so I get podcast rejections all the time. Uh, now, um, I've interviewed 70, 75 amazing people. But I must have been rejected 350 times. Now, what initially goes through my head when there's a rejection to my podcast is, oh, they don't think my podcast is any good, or they don't even know what it is, or I obviously don't have a big enough brand, I'm not good enough, you know, they don't like me, they've looked at, they've, they've researched me and, you know, don't, they don't like what I say, there's something about me they don't like. And, and that, that, that's the initial reaction I always have. Now, 12 years of personal development and growing a business and investing a lot of money in courses and mentors and that kind of thing. I'm reading a lot of books and audio books has helped me shorten the amount of time that I do that. I, I do that for days, months, weeks, or even years, you know, when I was an artist and before that, but sometimes it now last a second or, you know, it might last a few seconds or it might last a nanosecond. I still do the same thing. I go through the same dialogue that the vulnerable, weak, bullied young kid went through when all the other kids were getting more attention or were better at sport or the, girl, the kids that were getting the girls when I wasn't because I was really overweight or, you know. But you can learn to shorten that dialogue in your head by basically just, again, like I said at the start of this call, every time you go, I'm not good enough, I'm getting rejected and anything that you say, they don't like me, I'm, you know, I'm not going to make it. Um, they don't think I've got skills. They think I'm a newbie. You know, they, they don't, they don't, they, they judge me. You know, they, don't, they think I'm too old. They think I'm too young. They think I'm a woman. I can't do it. They think I'm a man. I can't do it. You know, whatever, all these things that we'll have. Immediately in your head, you want to take that exercise, like I said, which is where you draw, take a pen and paper and draw the line down the middle. And you immediately want to go, wait a minute, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. I've got this. I know how to do this. I'm good at this. And you want to have this dialogue in your head where you start talking yourself around. Um, now, how do I do that? So I, um, I got a letter from David Attenborough. I'd really love to have him on my podcast. And um, it was a rejection letter. It basically said, I hope you will forgive me, um, but I won't be coming on your show. And it was a bit of a weird one because I was so pleased to get a letter from David Attenborough, who's obviously a complete legend. And it was like the kindest rejection ever. And I felt like, how sweet was that? But I still felt rejected and I still felt, why don't you want to go on my show? What's wrong with my show? My show could be great for you. You know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but thankfully that, that, that didn't last very long. Um, but I had to remind myself that I'm still me, whether he rejects me or not. 
he doesn't know me. And if he knew me, he probably would want to come on the show. Um, my show serves nearly 2 million people in 192 countries. OK, you know, he's older and more experienced and maybe has reached more people. But I can't compare myself. He's, he's 80 something. I'm 39. When I'm 80, I'll probably have the reach that he's got. Um, so do you see what I mean? I'm not saying this to be flippant or cocky. I'm saying this because this is I've got to look at both sides of the equation. If I'm if I'm going to beat myself up, I've also got to lift myself up. Um, otherwise, I'm not taking a balanced view. So all the things you say to yourself when you get rejected and all those feelings of fear, the way you overcome them is by pointing out the polarised opposite and all the things that you do have and you have got. And if you're going to compare yourself to someone and compare yourself negatively, you should compare yourself positively to give yourself balance. Because it's when you're out of balance that when you feel all of these emotions. Now, the emotions you think are bad. The emotions aren't bad. The emotions are feedback to get back into balance. So fear of rejection is feedback to learn to own the things that you're not owning that would make you more confident. And you as a confident person, not an arrogant person, but a confident person, serves humanity better. Because you're able to go and train, teach and lead and create products and services that humanity need. So humanity overall needs you to, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, <coughs> so I get a bit excited, I choked on my own shouting, <laughs> humanity needs you to own and be confident at what you, the purpose is for you to serve, you know, what your mission is, your vision, what the things that you're supposed to do in the world, does that make sense? So would there be anything else that would stop you going into a competitive marketplace and going and doing what you know you should do, that you know you want to do? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OK, um, I'm actually going to write a book on this, um, how to improve your self-worth. It'll be called something slightly different um, because uh, more and more in the last 12 years of teaching hundreds of thousands of people in property, business, personal development, the root cause of any challenges usually goes back to self-worth. Now, sometimes it's an external thing, like I'm just not experienced yet. And once they've got a bit more experience, then their self-worth in that area would increase. But how, that's the paradox, isn't it? Once I get good enough, then I'll be good enough. But how do you get good enough not feeling that you're good enough? Well, the way you do that is that there is a... There is a seed process, a nurturing process, a fertilisation process towards any pursuit. Any pursuit. So, you know, there's no point feeling a lack of self-worth in something that you've never done because no one's good at something they've never done. No one. It's a big myth that people are naturally gifted at X. They may have other tendencies that help X, like physical attributes or experience in other niches that they can bring in. Like if I set up a business now, I've got 12 years of business that I can count on. But if I started yoga today, I'm starting from the start and I'm no good at yoga. Um, and I've got a lot of self-worth issues around doing yoga in front of anyone. So much so that Gemma said she'll pay for someone to come to the house and do yoga in the, the living room in front of no one. I've still got self-worth issues of doing it in front of a yoga instructor. Um, so, but the reality is, I felt like that about martial arts. I felt that, like that about money, property, business, public speaking, podcasting. And I went out there and, you know, I just start, take, start, started to take some baby steps. So self-worth shouldn't be measured when you're starting something new about how good you are, because everybody starts, you know, every master was once a disaster, every winner was once a beginner. So what you've got to do is separate your self-worth from the thing that you're trying to do. You know, like me learning astrophysics shouldn't affect my self-worth. It should just mean that I'm not experienced in astrophysics and now I'm going to go and learn it. Uh, and actually, what people weren't born to be a minimised version of themselves. Everybody was born to be a maximum full potential of themselves uh, and humanity can f accept us all into society because we're all unique and we all have a different set of values in a different order we've all brought up in a different environment with different media and different parenting and different influences 
So everybody is unique. No two people on the planet have the same genetic code or set of values. Therefore, we all have a place and a purpose. Uh, and therefore, humanity, other people and humanity in general, needs us to maximise and live to our full potential. Otherwise, we don't serve maximum growth for humanity and survive and thrive. So in that regard, you know, your self-worth is who you are, not who you think you should be or what you can't yet do. So if you know you're unique, you know the recipe of who you are, which no one else has, has its own unique place and purpose. And you don't compare yourself to anyone else because the only space you're trying to fill is yourself. And then you honour that and live by that. That is your maximum point of self-worth. Because self-worth is basically saying, this is me. This is who I am. I'm proud of who I am. I'm confident without being cocky. And I'm going to try and work out how who I am serves the, the planet and the most amount of people that I possibly can. And the opposite of self-worth is comparing myself to someone else, trying to be more like them when that's their purpose, not mine. So I am minimising myself, comparing myself to someone else who's living their own purpose. Now, the reason we get inspired by others is not because we necessarily want to be them. It's because we can sense that they're living their purpose. And... Um, we feel all out of balance when we know we're not living our purpose. Now, ironically, the things that can cause us the most amount of challenge and pain are our purpose. So I know it sounds a bit overly, overly simplistic, but the reality of this is loving yourself for who you are and knowing you have a place in society that is equal to everybody else, not over or under. When you, get, when you feel you're superior, you will have to be humbled. When you feel you're inferior, you will often get supported. You know, people like me coming out and helping you and doing this call. Um, but then you still have to own the lessons that you need to grow to become who you're supposed to become. Mm -hmm. Make as many notes as you like. Yeah, do. Share them. Share, if you could share a summary of this call, because... I've talked around a bit, a bit. It's a lot of words. We've been doing this for 33 minutes, if you can believe that. Um, so, yeah. Is there anything else you want to summarise from... Far away, yeah. One more thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. So if I could summarise it, if there's some things you feel very vulnerable about um, and not confident, could it be that you shouldn't be doing that? Could it be that you should be doing something else? It absolutely could be. Um, you know, I, I felt vulnerable, exposed, a lack of freedom working for someone else. Uh, and there were periods in my life when I did work for someone else. I worked for my dad because he was ill and because I didn't have a lot of money. And then I got a job at a property company, which I lasted less than a year in. And yeah, I had those vulnerable feelings. And searching inside for what those feelings meant, it didn't take me very long because it was bloody obvious to me. But sometimes I go into areas where it's not obvious. It, it was clear to me that this was actually just the wrong thing. This is a good point. And because sometimes you know, really fighting hard, doing something that you just really don't want to do, um, is this, the feedback is you shouldn't be doing it. But I think if you took yourself out of the emotion, i.e. went to a coffee shop at 11 o'clock in the morning and, and didn't make judgments about your career and your life and where you're going to try and master when you're emotional, I think that helps. So one of the worst things we can do is make important decisions when we're emotional. And that could be high as well as low. Um, so what you do is, when you're feeling overly high or overly low, which all of us do, um, l let that feeling subside before you make an important strategic decision about your life. And then have a coffee or whatever your you know, drink or um, comfort of choice is. Go to a coffee shop or somewhere nice where you feel you're in a conducive environment for thought uh, and then think, should I be doing this? So um, if I think about yoga, um, 
it's something that my wife wants me to do and it's something that I'm tempted to do. And it's the same with meditation. I've tried it quite a few times and I've got nearly but not quite. Now, I, I do my own versions of meditation. I, I, I do certain exercises which make me feel in flow and very present. And I, so it's my own version of mindfulness. And, you know, martial arts, I used to do chi na chi gung, which are very, they're, they're sort of slightly more fighting arts of a fair, quite active yoga. So there's definitely something there that's there. But I'm never going to know until I give it a proper go. Um, and if I give it a proper go, then I'll know and I'll either keep at it or I'll merge into doing a more active form of yoga or that'll inspire me to get into martial arts. Because beneath it all, it's the flexibility and the breathing and the presence, which clearly I need um, because I tend to be a bit always switched on and rarely switched off. Um, so I don't know if yoga's for me, but I don't know until I've given it a proper go. Now, I say yoga because it's just a random example. I never do a live feed yoga ever. No way. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's a good question. Understanding where something is a challenge and there's fear and vulnerability, but you know you've got to master that because that's what you're meant to be and who you are. And then when you're going through needless pain and that's linked to vision and values, you know, what, what is my clear vision? Where do I want to go? If you want to be a property investor and you want to build a portfolio and give back to your community, then viewings and offers and raising finance and taking rejection in those areas are all a necessary part of fulfilling that potential. Now, you know, you've got to get right on that border and give yourself a proper chance to do it before maybe you know. But I think deep in your heart, you, you're, you know your own truth. You know if feeling vulnerable and getting rejected and going and hiding because, you know, you were in a marketplace where there was comp competition. You know if that's just you feeling scared or actually something you know you shouldn't do. I don't think anybody needs any advice from me on that. I think because the emotion is so strong, you can't contextualise it. And that's why you've got to let the emotion should subside and then think about it. Also, something else is I think life is just a series of tests. Now, um, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I've done it my whole life, whether it's sports or wanting to be good, perceived by others or, you know, in my business or what I do with my creating my content. Um, writing my books and there's a there's a, a point where enough pressure there's distress and eustress eustress is positive pressure you know the pressure that creates a diamond so that that border where you've got a deadline where you're a bit pushed someone's pushing you a bit beyond your limits but too much is distress where you know it, it hurts too much or you're going into risk or failure or whatever so um too much pressure on yourself is distress, not you stress. And try and balance that by having a bit of positive pressure, but not putting too much pressure on yourself. So, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of finance that falls out of bed. You're going to have a lot of deals you don't get. If I want great guests, I'm probably going to have to take four in five knockbacks uh, of guests. Now, if I want to put positive meaning on it, I could say, well, a no is closer to a yes and they just don't know me yet. And when they really do listen to my podcast, they'll definitely want to be on it. And, you know, if I'm going to make up a reality, because I don't know why they rejected me. I have no idea because they don't tell you. And a lot of them are just being, a lot of it, we're just getting rejected by the agent. And I haven't even, we haven't even got to them. But if I want to make a meaning that's empowering, the meaning should be, well, you know, they just don't know why it works for them yet. They just don't know why they need it. They don't know why it's great. And when they do, they'll want to do it. And if they don't want to do it, it's clearly not right. And that's the feedback I need. So, yeah. Some things to think about for your Saturday morning, M. And everyone watching and listening. Wow. All right. So I hope you found that useful. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I look forward to your notes. If you could share those notes and tag me in, I'll probably put them as show notes in the uh, podcast. Great. All right. Have a lovely day. Take care. Bye. Wow. So I just did a live coaching call. Obviously, you couldn't hear them speaking because it was uh, I didn't want I wanted to keep them anonymous. But yeah, that was going to be a five minutes and it was 40 minutes. I hope you found that useful. Hope you got some help and benefit from it. Have a great day. And remember, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Oh, one more thing before you go. Before you go. Um, if you think there's anyone that's struggling, if you think there's anyone that has low self-worth, you don't necessarily have to publicise it. If you think there's anyone that you care about that you want to support, maybe you could share this um, live video and this podcast with them. Um, because, you know, uh, I tend to find that these 
um, issues that came up, low self-worth, rejection, fear, they're common and ubiquitous in everything that we do and successful people feel them just as much as what people perceive as unsuccessful people. Um, and I think if we can all step up and become the version of ourselves we're meant to be, I think that the, the, the planet as a whole is going to be a much better place and of course you're going to make a lot more money and, and, and live a more balanced life um, if that's what you're after. So yeah, please do share it with someone you think could get benefit from it.